are the issues about how we understand mental illness today? I think the first thing to say about mental illness today is that there's an epidemic of mental illness in the world today, partly because we are creating a very unstable world, a very unequal world, and this is not good for uh, human states of consciousness. Um, so that's one reason why this issue is of enormous and pressing concern to most of us. Many of us have had these experiences ourselves or know someone very near and dear to us who is having them. So that's a kind of political kind of uh, starting point in thinking about mental illness today. I'm also very interested in the philosophical aspects of the thing. Uh, interested, for example, in difficulties to do with uh, diagnosis and um, questions to do with whether mental illness is the same kind of thing as physical illness or not. One of the things which is uh, an important matter to me in this regard is that I think that mental illness is quite different from physical illness in that mental illness is something that we have in the final analysis more control over uh, ourselves. So one of the things I've been thinking about and talking about quite a bit recently is the way in which it is possible, for example, in relation to depression and anxiety to fight those conditions to some significant extent using philosophy. Uh, the philosophy of the Stoics, for example, from uh, ancient Rome, the philosophy of, uh, of Buddhism, uh, these are tools that can be used to uh, achieve some kind of um, security and some kind of power over one's uh, mental states. This is an ancient wisdom, if you will, which gives people a, a set of tools to tackle uh, mental illness. And if those tools become better known, if philosophy becomes more influential in relation to thinking about psychology, I think that could be a, a powerful uh, new wave uh, for the 21st century. Really interesting. So um, the more we can invest in philosophy, and, um, the better chance we've got to... Um, that's really interesting to like give people a sense of um, empowerment that they can tackle these mental illnesses. Yeah, um, yeah. I believe, that, uh, I believe that philosophical thinking and philosophical understanding and the kind of agency that that can bring about can be an important way in which quite a lot of very distressing mental conditions can become less distressing and one can come to have a certain kind of power uh, in relation to them which one didn't have before. Really interesting. Um, so can you give some examples? Can you, can you develop on that in, in, in more detail? Yeah, so one of the basic things I'm arguing is that when we think of mental illness, we think of something that's uh, wrong with us, that is, uh, is causing us distress, that is causing us uh, suffering. And one of the quite controversial claims that I'm making is that in a certain sense, that is the, the wrong move to make, that, to think that there's actually anything wrong with us. In other words, I want to say that the part, a key part of the way out of, um, of uh, anxiety and depression, provided it doesn't get too extreme, um, is to understand that in a certain sense there really isn't anything uh, wrong with you uh, and that the kinds of uh, distressing thoughts uh, and feelings that you're having are um, uh, maybe perfectly natural. Uh, and that um, provided you don't um, believe in them and get swept away by them, then actually there needn't be any uh, way in which this harm, this suffering that you've been subject to continues. So to, to make that even a bit more uh, concrete, if you are faced with a uh, distressing, repetitive uh, thought, um, one thing you can do with that is to uh, not believe in the thought uh, and to face the distressing feeling or sensation that goes with it, to give that your, your full attention, to meditate on it, if you will. Um, and then what you, will, what you may well find is that the, the sensation or the thought uh, uh, diminishes, uh, gradually kind of uh, goes away. You can return to simply being present uh, in the present. And that's partly coming from uh, the kinds of um, um, agency and power that uh, Stoicism or Buddhism uh, can give one, a kind of sense of one's own agency and one's own consciousness as something that is more fundamental uh, than any um, fleeting thought or feeling. And as I say, if you don't believe in these uh, negative repetitive thoughts that are so characteristic of anxiety and depression, uh, and if you are able to face uh, the, uh, the feeling or the sensation that goes along uh, with them, 
then part of what you're doing is you're kind of empowering your own uh, consciousness to, to realize that you are bigger than your problem. Uh, and as soon as you make that kind of move, as soon as you have that kind of sense of uh, agency, then you're a long way towards solving the problem. So to come back to where I started with that, the claim that I'm making in a way could be put in this way, that if you understand that mental illness, that mental distress, as I say, provided it doesn't get too severe, provided it doesn't become something like a, a psychosis, if you understand that those things are passing uh, things which, uh, which need not give you, uh, need not condemn you to a sense of these being who you are or what you are, that your consciousness is bigger than these uh, things. That is itself a huge clue to how you can get beyond them. So is, is CBT just Seneca in, you know, in an acronym? Is that, do you think cognitive behavioral therapy is kind of just the reworking of very old truisms that people have mm. known for a long time? Yeah, so I think that cognitive behavioral therapy can be uh, a very useful um, set of tools for dealing with anxiety and depression. I think that uh, mindfulness-based uh, cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is the, the best way to go. I think that uh, mindfulness-based uh, approaches in this area uh, clearly go back to uh, Stoicism and or to Buddhism or to allied uh, wisdom traditions. Uh, and in this way, I think that these kinds of uh, philosophical starting points are, are hugely valuable in terms of getting us to understand uh, the kind of way in which we can uh, take care of ourselves and give ourselves uh, a kind of agency and power which can seem to be very remote from us if we are pursued by anxious or depressing uh, thoughts. So cognitive behavioral therapy is often presented in this uh, very kind of um, uh, scientific and sort of modern way, but I think it's really helpful to recapture the ancient philosophical roots of it. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.